Welcome to part three on the road to secession. Now we're going to talk about the courts and political parties. Sectional tension mile marker number four has to do with a court case that took place in Massachusetts, a court case called Commonwealth versus Aves of 1836. What had happened here was that a Louisiana woman by the name of Mary Slater had come to Massachusetts with a young female slave named Med. Mary Slater took ill while she was there, and she left Med in the care of her father in Massachusetts, Thomas Aves, right? The, hope, the, the request was, you know, take care of my slave until I'm healthy enough to retrieve her. But the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society hears about Med in the possession of Thomas Aves, and they're going to file a writ of habeas corpus demanding that Med be freed. Their argument is simply this. Slavery in Massachusetts is abolished. And so, therefore, this slave cannot be a slave in Massachusetts. This slave is free. The Massachusetts Supreme Court is going to agree. It's going to rule that slaves brought into Massachusetts are automatically free the moment they set foot in the uh, state. Now, the question here is, does this violate the Constitution? Well, technically, no. And here's the reason why. Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution states, that no person held to service or labor in one state and under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any laws or regulation therein be discharged from such service labor but shall be delivered upon the claim of the party whom such service or labor may be due. The key word here is escaping. In the case of Med, she didn't escape. She was brought into Massachusetts. And so therefore the Supreme Court of Massachusetts says because it's not an escape slave, Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution does not apply, and therefore Med is free. Commonwealth versus Aves established the precedent that slavery was local, but liberty was general, which is going to be built upon when we see sectional tension mile marker number five which was the creation of the first abolitionist political party, the Liberty Party. It was created in 1840. This is the first attempt to take that moralistic uh, abolitionist movement out of the uh, realm of moralism and into the realm of politics where you have to have that little bit of compromise as well. Um, it's not going to be successful. It's going to run a presidential candidate in 1840 and 1844, James Burney, that same James Burney that said, slavery is a sin before God. Right. And in the process of beginning the, their uh, presidential campaign of 1848, the party is actually going to fall apart. Right. But it's going to set the groundwork for the uh, anti-slavery parties that will follow. Right. That eventually will lead up to the one that uh, becomes more permanent, the one that's still around today, the Republican Party. The next sectional tension mile marker, mile marker number six, is another court case, but this time it's the U.S. Supreme Court, Prigg versus Pennsylvania of 1842. Now, initially, Southerners thought this was a great victory for them. Pennsylvania had a personal liberty law that was similar to what was going on in Massachusetts that declared escaped slaves into their state free. The U.S. Supreme Court struck this law down, said you can't do that. And the reason why is that the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 is a federal law and therefore falls under federal jurisdiction. You declaring them free is you taking uh, possession of what is something that's under federal jurisdiction, right? So Southerners are like, yeah, they stuck it to Pennsylvania was trying to make our slaves free, but it actually backfired on them. Pennsylvania is going to turn around and pass a responding law that just orders their local authorities not to aid in the capturing of any slaves that that flee into their state. Their argument is simply this. Hey, the Supreme Court said that enforcing the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 doesn't fall under our jurisdiction. Therefore, we are under no obligation to help. So Southerners are starting to lose faith in the Constitution. By 1850, Northern violations of the Fugitive Slave Law had really become a major Southern grievance. And they began believing that the Constitution was no longer a reliable protection of their peculiar institution. So they began to look elsewhere. Southerners came to believe that it was necessary to seek a better defense than the provisions that the Constitution itself provide, provided. 
So they began to seek to take control of a single national political party. Right? They believed that by controlling one political party that they could dominate all branches of the national government, control political patronage, and protect that institution of slavery from northern assaults. So they want to take control of a political party. The next question becomes, which party are they going to take control of? Well, the answer here is pretty obvious. It's the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was the perfect one to unite all Southerners under one political banner. When you take a look at the other political parties, this makes more sense. I mean, you can, of course, take control of what the, the Liberty Party or some of its follow-ons, like the Free Soil Party or the Republican Party. Those are anti-slavery parties. The Whig Party is the only other viable option, but the Whig Party itself is pretty divided. You have some aristocratic slave owners in the South that are members, but then you also have northern abolitionist factory owners. Matter of fact, the issue of slavery is ultimately going to cause the Whig Party to tear itself apart and disappear. The Democratic Party is really the only one that's left. And so slavery is going to unite Southerners under the Democratic Party, where they're going to take the Democratic Party and transform it from one that uh, defended Jefferson's agrarian societal ideals and to one that supported the Jackson image of the common man and turn it into a political party that was geared at defending the institution of slavery.